Hello, this is Dr. Hana Asil, and this is Unit 2 of October 2023. Uh, this is the Pearson Edexcel AS Chemistry. So let us take a look at the questions and discuss the answers. So this is the first question. It says the mean CF bond enthalpy is 485 kilojoule per mole. That means to break one CF bond, we need to provide it with 485 kilojoule per mole. Which process has an enthalpy change of plus 1940? Now, if we look at 1940, if you divide that by 485, that means I need to break four bonds. So the question is, which of these reactions is breaking four CF bonds? So that would be this one. And remember that to break all the four bonds, this is an endothermic process. So this is correct. Which expression gives the standard enthalpy change for the reaction shown? And we're provided with delta H of formation of each of these. So that means that I can draw a Hess cycle like this, in which we're starting from the elements and going up. And then we're forming barium carbonate, and we have the delta H for that. We're forming one barium oxide. We're forming one CO2. And of course, from the Hess's cycle, going from the elements to barium carbonate and then the delta H of that reaction, all of this is equal to the other side, which is formation of barium oxide and CO2. So from that, the expression for the delta H is this one. Okay. Question three, the standard enthalpy changes of combustion for a series of alkanes are shown. Another alkane has enthalpy change of combustion of minus 6125, which is the most likely formula for this alkane. So what we do is we look at going from one to the other. So from C2 to C3, the difference is about 660. From C3 to C4, the difference is about 660 also. From uh, C4 to C5, the difference is about 630. So we are asking for 6125. That means we're going a difference of 2616. Each carbon, each additional carbon needs about what? 630? About. So that means that we're adding about four carbons to the C5. And that means we're looking at C9H20. Can you see how we got that? Which row in the table shows the forces between the molecules in the liquid state? So BF3, what kind of forces do we have in BF3? Remember that each BF bond is polar and overall the molecule is nonpolar. Now, first of all, does this molecule have London forces between the molecules? Any simple molecular structure would have London dispersion forces. So when he says no, there is no London forces in the BF3, that's wrong. When we talk about methane, Methane has London dispersion forces between them. That is the induced dipoles due to the electron clouds of one repelling the electron clouds of the other. So this has London dispersion forces. It doesn't have permanent dipole-dipole because there are no polar, no differences in electronegativity. So there are no polar bonds. Will it have hydrogen bonding? Remember, to have hydrogen bonding, we need a hydrogen attached to an electronegative element. Carbon is not regarded as an electronegative element. So when the question says, yes, hydrogen bonding CH4, that's wrong. What about ammonia? Ammonia, remember we said all of these would have London dispersion forces. So ammonia molecules have London dispersion forces between them. Do they have permanent dipoles? 
actually yes they should they have permanent dipoles and they have hydrogen bonding because there is an electronegative element which is nitrogen attached to hydrogen so each molecule has a permanent dipole so there is permanent dipole dipole interaction and they can form hydrogen bonds between the molecules so what is written in the table is wrong what about h2s well h2s each bond may be regarded as polar it has london dispersion forces it has permanent dipoles but it does not form hydrogen bonding because the difference in electronegativity is not that big so it's not like n and h so this will not form hydrogen bonding so that information is correct which of these isoelectronic compounds would be expected to have the highest boiling temperatures okay what determines which one has highest boiling temperature first of all anything that has an oh an alcohol would have higher than something that doesn't have uh, an oh because the presence of the alcohol group allows hydrogen bonding between the molecules which are stronger than the normal london dispersion forces between alkanes for example so anything with an oh would have a higher boiling point than pentane for example which is uh, an alkane that has only london dispersion forces okay among all the choices of the alcohols which one would have the highest boiling temperature remember that something that has a straight chain would have higher boiling temperature than a branched chain what is the value of n in the half equation we're basically uh, balancing the equation so if i have o2 i have two oxygens uh, in O2 and two oxygens into H2O. So before the arrow, I have a total of four oxygens. I need four oxygens after the arrow. So after the arrow, I must have four. This way, I have four oxygens and four hydrogens before and after the arrow. Now we need to balance the charges. If I have four negative charges after the arrow, that means I need four electrons before the arrow. which equation shows a disproportionation reaction first of all let's remind ourselves what is a disproportionation reaction it's a reaction in which a certain species so one species gives two forms after the arrow with two different oxidation numbers so that it is both oxidized and reduced in the same reaction or in the same equation so we're basically we're looking for something that has two species after the arrow and one before the arrow that are the same that are similar species so first equation doesn't have that second equation doesn't have that third equation doesn't have that now if we look at d what do we have we have sulfur before the arrow i have one form of sulfur after the arrow i have two forms of sulfur so let's take a look at the oxidation numbers they should be one of them oxidizing and the other reducing so in one case the oxidation number should increase and in the other it should decrease so what is the oxidation number of sulfur in s2 o3 2 minus well each oxygen is minus two that means i have minus six so and i have an overall of two minuses that means the two sulfurs should be plus four and that means each sulfur is plus two following so in s2o3 two minus the sulfur has oxidation number plus two now in so2 each oxygen is minus two so the oxygens are minus four so the sulfur alone has to be plus four and then sulfur start standing alone we said elements have an oxidation number of zero so in one case the sulfur is changing from plus two to plus four and that is oxidation and in the second case the it is changing from plus two to zero and that is reduction so that is the one that is a disproportionation reaction 
When sodium bromide reacts with concentrated sulfuric acid, sodium hydrogen sulfate is always formed. What other products are formed? Remember, uh, when talking about the halides, we said they can react with concentrated sulfuric acid. Now, if we have a chloride reacting with concentrated sulfuric acid, it will give HCl and that's it because HCl is not a strong reducing agent. So no further reactions happen. When we react with a bromide, then I have HBr formed, but then the HBr will continue to react with the sulfuric acid. So it will form what? It will form sulfur dioxide and bromine. So actually, when we react a bromide with concentrated sulfuric acid, we should have all of these products. Iodide, when we react it with concentrated sulfuric acid, it gives the HI. The HI is a very strong reducing agent, so it continues to react with the concentrated sulfuric acid. So I can have sulfur dioxide, iodine, sulfur, and H2S, uh, gas, and all of these because the HI is a strong reducing agent. So he's talking here about what? About the bromide. The bromide gives hydrogen bromide, but then the hydrogen bromide continues to react to give sulfur dioxide and bromine. So my products are bromine, hydrogen bromide, and sulfur dioxide gas. Which property decreases as group two is descended? So as we go down group two, which property decreases? Is it atomic radius? Of course not. As we go down, the atomic radius increases. Is it reactivity? No. As we go down, the reactivity increases. What about solubility? Solubility of, of what? Of hydroxide or of sulfate? We're looking at solubility of sulfate. As we go down for the solubility of sulfates, this decreases. We said the hydroxides going down, solubility increases. But if we're talking about carbonate or sulfate or nitrate, the solubility going down the group decreases. Thermal stability, thermal stability increases because as we go down the group, the compounds, the nitrates become more stable and that means they will not dissolve, they will not break down uh, by heating as we go down the group. In a neutralization reaction, 20 centimeter cubed of 0.5 mole per decimeter cubed nitric acid reacts with 10 centimeter cubed of 1 mole per decimeter cubed aqueous sodium hydroxide. What is the concentration of sodium nitrate produced? In order to get concentration of sodium nitrate, we must first calculate the number of moles of whatever we have information for. So we said 20 centimeter cubed of 0.5 mole per decimeter cubed nitric acid, that means I can get number of moles of nitric acid. Number of moles of a solution is concentration times volume. Concentration is 0.5 and the volume 20 centimeter cubed, we have to divide by a thousand. Most students forget to divide by a thousand and just put it as 20. This is not 20, it is 20 divided by 1000, so that is 0 0.02. So the number of moles of nitric acid is 0 0.01. We have information about both reactants, so we have to get the number of moles of both reactants to make sure that uh, not one of them is excess and the other limiting and so on. So if we calculate the number of moles of sodium hydroxide, Concentration times volume, again, divide the 10 centimeter cubed by 1,000 times the concentration. So the number of moles of sodium hydroxide is 0 0.01. And the equation that we have says one mole of nitric acid reacts with one mole of sodium hydroxide to give one mole of sodium nitrate. 
So all of these have the same number of moles. So that means that the number of moles of sodium nitrate is 0.01. Now, what is the question asking for? Concentration. How do we get concentration? Concentration is number of moles over volume. Now, the common mistake that students do in this kind of question is, what is the total volume? We're saying we added 20 centimeter cubed of nitric acid to 10 centimeter cubed of sodium hydroxide. The total volume is 30 centimeter cubed divided by 1000, so that would come out to 0 0.03. So that's my total volume. So number of moles that we calculated over the total volume gives the concentration of sodium nitrate. Question 11 says the equation for the reaction of sulfur dioxide with oxygen is shown. What is the effect of a decrease in temperature? Okay, if we have a reversible reaction, if we decrease temperature, you should know decreasing temperature causes the equilibrium to shift to the side that is exothermic. So in this case, the reaction, delta H of the reaction is a negative value. That means the forward is exo. So if I decrease temperature, this reaction goes forward. This reaction goes forward. That means the yield of the SO3 will increase or decrease. Remember, yield means the amount that I get of the SO3. If the reaction goes forward, then the yield increases. We get more of SO3. What happens to the rate when we decrease temperature? Remember, when we're talking about rate, decreasing temperature decreases the rate. When we're talking about a reversible reaction, Decreasing the temperature causes it to go to the side that is exothermic. So in this case, decreasing the temperature would cause the rate to decrease, but it shifts forward, so it gives more SO3, so the yield increases. What is the effect of an increase in pressure? So we have the reaction again, and we said, if we increase pressure, what happens? The equilibrium shifts to the side that gives less molecules. So which side gives less molecules? Going forward, it will give two moles of SO3. Going backward, it gives two moles of SO2 plus a mole of O2. So that means going back will give three. Going forward gives two. Increase in pressure causes this reaction to go forward. What happens to the rate of any reaction when we increase pressure? Since all of these are gases, increasing pressure increases the rate. So the rate increases and the yield of SO3 increases. A mixture of one centimeter cubed of 0.2 mole per decimeter cubed potassium chromate and 5 centimeter cubed of 1 mole per decimeter cubed sulfuric acid forms this equilibrium. <clears throat> so the equation shows that the chromate is yellow, the uh, product which is dichromate is orange. So that means if the reaction goes forward, it becomes more orange. If it goes back, it becomes more yellow. What would be the effect, if any, on the color of the solution if? 5 centimeter cubed of 1 mole per decimeter cubed sodium hydroxide were added. Now, if we add sodium hydroxide, what effect does that have on this reaction? Remember, sodium hydroxide is a base. If I add a base to this reaction mixture, it will react with the H+. And that means it's as if I'm using up the H+. Plus. I am removing the H+, plus, and that means the point of equilibrium will move to the left or the reaction goes backward to produce more H+. Plus. Now, if the reaction goes backward, what happens to the color? It becomes more yellow. 
Tertiary alcohols are used in manufacture of petrol additives. Which of these is a tertiary alcohol? In order to know that, we should draw each of them. So let's draw one methyl cyclopentanol. One methyl cyclopentane. Cyclopentane means uh, it's a cycle like this, cyclic compound with five carbons. It's pentanol, and that means there's an OH, and that is carbon number one. And if we say one methyl, that means there is a methyl group on that same carbon. And that means that carbon is attached, the carbon that has the OH is attached to three other carbons. That means this is the tertiary alcohol. What if we look at the others? Two methyl, cyclo, pentanol, that means the all, the OH is carbon number one. The methyl is on carbon number two. Each of these are um, on the OH is attached to a carbon that is attached to only two carbons. So this is actually a secondary alcohol. 2-methyl-butane-1-all. Now the OH is attached to a carbon that is attached to how many carbons? One. So this is primary. 3 methyl pentane 2 all 3 methyl pentane 2 all this again is a secondary alcohol which reagent reacts with tertiary alcohols does acidify potassium dichromate react with tertiary alcohols remember that potassium dichromate is an oxidizing agent if i react it with primary alcohol it gives what it gives an aldehyde and then an acid, carboxylic acid. With a secondary alcohol, it would give a ketone. But with a tertiary alcohol, it does not react. So this does not react with tertiary alcohols. What about bromine water? You should realize that bromine is uh, the reagent we use to test for alkenes. So it reacts with alkenes, not with uh, tertiary alcohols. What about phosphorus chloride, PCL5? Yes, PCL5 is actually the reagent we use to test for presence of an OH in the molecule because it changes the alcohol to the chloro compound. So this would react with a tertiary alcohol. What about sodium carbonate? Carbonates react with acids, not with alcohol. Infrared spectra may be used to identify organic compounds. When propane 2 all is refluxed with excess acidified potassium dichromate, the product will show what? Okay, let's take a look. This is propane 2 all, and that means this is a secondary alcohol. And we said when we acidify a secondary alcohol, we end up with a ketone. Now, when we have a ketone, First of all, we don't have an OH anymore, so A is wrong. But we have a C double bond O, and looking at the data booklet, remember you'll have a data booklet, where is the uh, stretch for the C double bond O of a ketone? Where is the ketone? 1720 to 1700. You get that from the data booklet. When propane 1 all is heated with acidified potassium dichromate. Now, this is propane one all. We said if we react it with an oxidizing agent, it could give an aldehyde or it could go on and give a carboxylic acid. Now, which one are we supposed to get here? The question says when propane one all is heated with acidified potassium dichromate, the product that is distilled off as it is formed. Now, if we distill off the product as it is formed, that means we're producing an aldehyde. So we look at the data book. Where is the C double bond O for? Aldehydes, 1740 to 1720. Separate solutions of one chloropropane, one bromopropane in ethanol are warmed with aqueous silver nitrate why does the formation of a precipitate take longer with one chloropropane? Of course, when we add silver nitrate to something that has chloro or bromo, it would give a precipitate of silver chloride or silver bromide. But in order to do that, we need to break 
the C uh, halogeno bond. So we have either CCl or CBr. And you should know as we go down group 7, the bond uh, between the carbon and the halogen becomes weaker, more easily broken. So the bromo would react faster than the chloro. Why? Because the CCl bond is stronger than the CBr bond. A sample of propane 1, 2 diol with a mass of 1.52 grams reacts completely with phosphorus pentachloride. What is the mass of the organic product? Remember propane 1, 2 diol. What is propane 1, 2 diol? This is reacting with phosphorus pentachloride and we said what happens is when we have an alcohol with the PCl5, we remove OH and put Cl. But here we're starting with what? Propane 1, 2, diol. And that means each of these OHs will be replaced by a Cl since uh, the question mentions that it reacts completely with excess PCl5. So this is the product. What are we required to do? We're required to get the mass of the product. Well, we need to get the number of moles of what we're starting with first. So the number of moles will be uh, mass over molecular mass. So we're getting the molecular mass of the reactant, the propane 1, 2 diol. So that is the MR. We know how to calculate MR, right? And remember, we use the mass number, which is the big number in the periodic table, not the atomic number. Anyway, so this is MR of what we're starting with. So I can get the number of moles mass over molecular mass. This gives 0 0.02 mole and that from the equation will give the same number of moles of product. So the number of moles of the product is 0 0.02. We can calculate the mass. First we're calculating the MR and the mass is number of moles times MR. So that gives 2.26 grams of product, of the organic product. Which compound reacts with ammonia to form this compound? So we're looking at this compound. This is a compound that has three carbons with an NH2 in the middle. So we can start with a chloro compound. Remember, we can have a halogeno alkane reacted with ammonia. The NH2 replaces the Cl. So in order to get this product, I cannot use C and D, first of all but I can use A or B, but which one will give my required product? It's the one that has the chloro in the middle, so 2-chloropropane. Okay, in section B, this question is about sodium hydroxide. The first part says write an ionic equation for the neutralization reaction between sodium hydroxide and hydrochloric acid. Normally, if you're not sure of what the ionic equation should be, we start with the normal balanced symbol equation. So I can write the equation for sodium hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid to give sodium chloride plus what? This is the normal neutralization reaction. But we require ionic. So we ionize anything that is aqueous, anything that's not solid, liquid, or gas. So the HCl uh, uh, acid is aqueous, I ionize it, H plus Cl minus. Sodium hydroxide is aqueous, Na plus OH minus. Sodium chloride is aqueous, Na plus Cl minus. Water is a liquid, it's not ionized, so it's written as it is. And then we cancel any ions that are the same on both sides of the arrow. Of course, we did not need to balance the equation because it's already balanced. That's why we did not do any balancing. So whatever remains, so that is H plus plus OH minus to give water. This is the ionic equation for a neutralization reaction. State what is meant by standard enthalpy change of neutralization. Please learn these definitions if you haven't yet. So standard enthalpy change of neutralization is 
the enthalpy change, or you could say heat change, that takes place when what? So all standard enthalpy change of something is the enthalpy change that takes place when? Now we're talking about neutralization. So when one mole of water is formed by reaction of an acid with an alkali under standard conditions. That is the delta H of neutralization. A student carried out an investigation to determine the enthalpy change of neutralization of aqueous sodium hydroxide by hydrochloric acid. Separate 25 centimeter cubed samples of 0.8 mole per decimeter cubed sodium hydroxide and 0.8 mole decimeter cubed of HCl were left to reach room temperature. So we have 25 of the sodium hydroxide plus 25 of the hydrochloric acid. After two minutes, after two minutes, the solutions were mixed in a copper calorimeter and the temperature was noted at 30 seconds intervals. And the graph is given. Use the graph shown to determine the maximum temperature change in this experiment. For this kind of reactions, what do we do? We join the points and then remember the question said, after two minutes, the solutions were mixed. So if I draw a line at the beginning and a line to join all those points, then we draw a vertical line at two minutes, that is at 120 seconds. So that vertical line has to be at 120 seconds. And that is a common mistake that students do. Notice, when did the reaction start? That's when you're going to draw the vertical line and we're asked to get the delta T. So the final temperature here is where these lines meet. So that's at 26.8. Notice that the temperature started at 22.4 from the graph. So the temperature change is 4.4 degrees Celsius. Then calculate the enthalpy change of neutralization using your answers. And remember, what did we say? Separate 25 centimeter cubes of sodium hydroxide and another 25 centimeter cubed of HCl. And that means the total mass of the solution is what? So when we're calculating, the first thing that we do is calculate Q. When we're calculating Q, the mass is the total mass of solution. And this is one mistake that students uh, do in this question. Their total mass is the 50 of the sodium hydroxide, 25 of sodium hydroxide plus 25 of hydrochloric. So the total is 50. C is given as 4.2. The delta T we got from the graph is 4.4. And what comes out from this equation is in joules, Usually, we divide by 1,000 and change it into kilojoules. Then we want to get delta H. Remember, delta H is Q over N. So we need to get the number of moles. Now, this is the equation that we have. The number of moles of water would be the same as the number of moles of sodium hydroxide um, or hydrochloric acid because the number of moles of all of them is 0.02. That means that we have number of moles of water and delta H would be the Q we got over the number of moles. Now why did we put a negative sign? We go back to the question and we found that there was a temperature rise. The temperature increased from about 22 to 26. So that is um, a temperature rise. That means this reaction was obviously exothermic. Exothermic means the delta H has to be a negative value. Explain how, if at all, the enthalpy change of neutralization would differ if the heat capacity of the calorimeter was included in the calculation. Remember, we use the heat capacity of water, which is 4.2. We do not include the heat capacity of, calor of the calorimeter. What is heat capacity? If you've done physics, you should know that the heat capacity is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature 
of this substance by one degree Celsius. So this is called the specific heat capacity. So in our calculations, we use only the heat used by the water, not by the calorimeter. If we include the uh, heat capacity of the calorimeter, then that means C will increase. And if C increases, that means Q increases. And that means the delta H would be higher or more exothermic since the total heat capacity would be greater. Aqueous sodium hydroxide reacts with one bromopropane to produce propane one all. So this compound that is drawn, this is one bromopropane. We're going to react it with sodium hydroxide to give the alcohol. What is the type and mechanism of this reaction? When we have a halogenoalkane reacting with hydroxide to give alcohol, this is nucleophilic substitution. We're going to re move the BR and replace it with an OH. Now, complete the mechanism. Curly arrows, lone pairs, dipoles. We know that the CBr bond has the carbon slightly positive, the BR slightly negative, of course, because the BR is more electronegative than the carbon. And that means the lone pair of electrons on the hydroxide ion, the lone pair of electrons, will attack the slightly positive carbon and the electrons that are being shared between the C and the Br will go to the slightly negative Br. And this means that we end up with the alcohol plus the bromide ions. Under different conditions, sodium hydroxide reacts with one bromopropane to form propene. Remember, we have two different types of reactions of hydroxide with halogenoalkane. If we put hydroxide aqueous, then the Br is replaced by OH, and that's the one we we're talking about. But if we put the hydroxide under another condition, and that other condition is what? In presence of ethanol, then this is an elimination reaction in which the H and the Br are removed from the halogenoalkane to form an alkene. So this is what we're talking about here. And the solvent should be ethanol. Question 19 says, this question is about some of the elements in group 7 of the periodic table. Mixtures of halide salts are found in brine solutions extracted from oil and gas wells. Iodine, which is used as a dietary supplement, may be obtained from these mixtures. A brine solution containing 2.49 grams of a mixture of potassium iodide and potassium chloride. So this 2.49 grams contains iodide and chloride. What did they do? They added excess silver nitrate to the solution to completely precipitate the halide ions. Of course, if I add excess silver nitrate, I will have a mixture of precipitates of silver iodide and silver chloride. But then they added excess aqueous ammonia. When we add excess aqueous ammonia, remember which of these precipitates will dissolve. Remember that the halides, chloride, bromide, iodide. We add silver nitrate, the form of precipitate. So we're going to have a precipitate with either of them. But then when we add aqueous ammonia, so if I add dilute aqueous ammonia, the precipitate of the chloride will dissolve. If I add concentrated aqueous ammonia, the bromide will dissolve. But if I add excess aqueous ammonia, iodide does not dissolve. So remember that when they added excess aqueous ammonia, they removed the chloride. So now we only have the precipitate from the iodide. 
the mixture was filtered and the solid was washed, dried and weighed and we got a mass of 0 0.162 grams. State the color of the solid. So, of course, chloride gives white precipitate, bromide gives cream, iodide gives yellow. So, my precipitate in the end is the iodide, so that is yellow. Calculate the percentage by mass of potassium iodide in the mixture. What did we do? We had 2.49 grams of the mixture. That's what we started. And then we added all of this and got only the iodide and the mass of the iodide was 0.162. What is the percentage by mass of the iodide? So the percentage by mass, we get the number of moles of the silver iodide mass over molecular mass 0.162 over the molecular mass of silver iodide so this is the number of moles of the iodide that is my final product now that would be the same as number of moles of uh, the potassium iodide that i started with mass of the potassium iodide would be the number of moles that we got times the molecular mass of potassium iodide and that means I have originally 0 0.1145 grams of the potassium iodide in the original mixture. I can then get the percentage, the mass of potassium iodide over the total 2.49 times 100 and that means this was 4.6% of that original mixture at the beginning. Chlorine gas may be prepared by heating concentrated hydrochloric acid with solid manganese oxide. Show by reference to oxidation numbers that this is a redox reaction. Of course, what do we mean by redox? Redox means uh, an, a reaction involving both oxidation and reduction. So let's look at the oxidation numbers of each of these. You should know how to calculate oxidation numbers. So in the MnO2, each oxygen is minus 2. I have two of them, so the oxygens are minus 4, and that means manganese should be plus 4 so that the overall is neutral. Now this changes to MnCl2. Of course, each Cl is minus 1. I have a total of 2, and that means the manganese should be plus 2. So the manganese changed from plus 4 to plus 2, the oxidation number went down, decreased, this is reduction. Now, the chloride in HCl has oxidation number minus 1, it changed 2. First of all, if you look at the MnCl2, this is the same oxidation number of minus 1. So, we don't take that into consideration. But it changed into Cl2, which is oxidation number zero. This is an element and its oxidation number is zero and that means the chlorine changed from minus one to zero. That is increase in oxidation number. That is oxidation. Can we see how we explain this? So the redox involves both oxidation and reduction and we have to indicate where did the reduction happen and where did the oxidation happen. Iodine may be obtained by bubbling chlorine gas through aqueous potassium iodide. When the reaction is complete, hexane is added and the mixture shaken. Two layers are formed. State the color of each layer. So that means we have iodine. If I put dissolve, iodine originally as a solid, it's a gray solid. But if it is dissolved in water, so the aqueous layer, this will be yellow. And if it dissolves in an organic layer like hexane, then it is purple or violet. Explain why iodine is more soluble in hexane than in water. By considering the intermolecular forces in iodine, hexane and water, and any intermolecular forces formed between iodine and the solvents. So, detailed descriptions of the forces are not required. So, let's take a look at 
the intermolecular forces in iodine, hexane, and water. You should realize that iodine molecules, between them, they have only London dispersion forces between the molecules. So these are weak and iodine cannot form hydrogen bonds. Now, when we look at hexane, it is the same kind of intermolecular forces. Hexane also has only London forces between the molecules. So these are weak and the iodine can dissolve in hexane easily. But when we look at water, you should realize that water has hydrogen bonds between the molecules and permanent dipole-dipole interactions in addition to London forces. Remember, all these simple molecules have London forces, which are very weak. But water also has permanent dipole-dipole and hydrogen bonds, and the hydrogen bonds are stronger. They cannot be broken easily, so the iodine does not dissolve easily in water. Remember, iodine cannot form hydrogen bonds. This question is about carbon dioxide. Carbonate ions may be identified by their reaction with acid. Remember, to test for carbonates, we add acids, and this produces carbon dioxide gas. So give the ionic equation and include state symbols. So we're starting with something carbonate. Remember, that could be aqueous or it could be a solid. I react it with an acid, which is aqueous. This gives carbon dioxide and water. Remember, carbon dioxide is a gas, water is a liquid, so we do not ionize them. So this is the overall ionic equation of uh, carbonates with acids. Lime water can be used to test for the presence of carbon dioxide. Remember, to test for carbon dioxide gas, we pass it through lime water. State what would be seen when carbon dioxide is bubbled through lime water. Of course, you should remember that when we bubble carbon dioxide gas through lime water, the lime water turns milky. A student determined the solubility of calcium hydroxide in water by titration with hydrochloric acid. This is the equation for the reaction. Calcium hydroxide powder was added to distilled water. The mixture was stirred until no more solid dissolved. The excess solid was filtered off, so we end up with a saturated solution. 25 centimeter cube portions of this solution were titrated with a certain concentration of hydrochloric acid using phenolphthalein as an indicator until two concordant titers were obtained. And the mean titer for the acid is 18.95 centimeter cubed. Calculate the concentration of saturated solution in grams per decimeter cube. So this is the equation. One mole of calcium hydroxide reacts with two moles of acid. Uh, they, they put 25 centimeter portions of the solution. So I have 20 five centimeter cubed of the calcium hydroxide and we titrated it with HCl. Now the HCl concentration 0.05 and the volume is the 18.95. So I can get the number of moles of HCl concentration times volume. Please remember the volume has to be in decimeter cubed. So we divide that 18.95 by 1000. This gives number of moles of HCl. Now, looking at the equation, the number of moles of calcium hydroxide should be half of that. And the concentration in uh, moles per decimeter cubed, we divide the number of moles over the volume. But the question wants it in grams, so I need to change the 0 0.019 mole into a mass. Mass is number of moles times mR. So you just multiply by the MR of calcium hydroxide, and this gives 1.4 grams per decimeter cubed. The student used the same procedure to determine the solubility of strontium hydroxide. Remember, we were getting solubility of calcium hydroxide. Explain whether or not the mean titer for strontium hydroxide would be different. So remember, what is the difference in solubility? 
we said strontium going down the group. If we're talking about solubility of hydroxide, going down the group, the solubility increases. So strontium hydroxide is more soluble. That means I will have more strontium hydroxide in the solution. And that means the titer will be higher. Remember, the hydroxide ions, as we go down the um, uh, uh, group 2, the hydroxides become more and more solid. Between 1960 and 2020, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere rose be, uh, from 320 parts per million to 420 parts per million. The recent rapid increase in the atmospheric carbon dioxide is affecting the chemistry of seawater. Carbon dioxide dissolves in water to form carbonic acid. The carbonic acid then dissociates in water according to this equilibrium explain in terms of the equilibrium the effect of the increase in atmospheric carbon dioxide on the acidity of seawater. Okay, so we're saying carbon dioxide in the air increases. But then he says the carbon dioxide dissolves in water to form carbonic acid. That means the amount of carbonic acid is increasing and that means the equilibrium in that equation will shift to the, to the right. So more H2CO3, equilibrium shifts to the right, forms more H+, plus, so the solution becomes more acidic. This question is about some organic molecules which are important in production of adhesives and coatings. Compound X is a liquid containing carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. A sample of X has these masses and we're required to get the empirical form. Again, how do we get empirical formula? We have carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. The question says the total mass of X is 1.92. Now, 1.08 is carbon, 0 0.131 is hydrogen. So, of course, the mass of the oxygen is the rest of the 1.92. So, we get the mass of oxygen and then we can calculate empirical formula. So, these are the masses and we said to get empirical formula, what is the first step? divide by mass number, which is the big number in the periodic table. So carbon by 12, hydrogen by 1, oxygen by 16, and we get these numbers. Then the next step would be to simplify these numbers by dividing by the smallest. So which of these is the smallest? You divide all through by it. This gives a ratio of 2 to 3 to 1, and that means that the empirical formula is C2 H3O. The mass spectrum of X is shown. Deduce the molecular formula of X using the mass spectrum and your answer. We said this is C2H3O. This is the empirical formula. And remember, the empirical formula shows the simplest ratio between the atoms. Now, looking at the mass spectrum, we said we look at the peak with the highest m over z. Where is the peak with the highest m over z? That's this one. This gives the mR of the molecule, the molecular mass of the molecule. So that means that the molecular mass is 86. Now when we want to get the original uh, actual molecular formula, we get the mR of the empirical. So the empirical was C2H3O. Get the MR of that, it comes out to be 43. But according to the mass spectrum, the MR should be 86. Now, 86 has how many 43s? 86 is twice the 43, and that means the actual molecular formula is twice of the empirical. So instead of C2H3O, it is actually C4H6O2. Then reagents were added to separate samples of X to identify the functional groups in the molecule. 
they added bromine water. When they added bromine water, the bromine water was decolorized. Now, the first question is, this is a test for what? Bromine water, when I add it to something and it becomes or it changes from orange to colorless, this is a test for alkene. So that means that this compound X contains an alkene group. Now, they added aqueous sodium carbonate and they got effervescence. When I add a carbonate to something and it gives off a gas that should be turned lime water milky, that is test for acids. That means I have a carboxylic acid. So that means that X has these two groups. Now use your answer and the mass spectrum, complete the table. So what peak is the one that is 41. The peak at 41 would be due to what? We have our molecule is C4H6O2. It has an alkene group and it has an acid group. So if we look at or if we count the masses, 41 is the mass of three carbons with their hydrogen. So it's actually the mass of C3H5. Remember, when you are identifying peaks in the mass spectrum, it has to be a positive ion. So this is the peak for C3H5+. plus. What about 45? Which of these would be 45? You'll find that if you calculate the MR of COOH, the total masses would be 45. So it is for this ion with a positive charge. Then it says X does not show geometric isomerism, so we can't have cis and trans. Now, what do we know about X? They want us to draw a displayed formula of X. What do we know about X? We know that it has four carbons and we know that it has a double bond somewhere and an acid group. So this would be a possible isomer in which the carbon on the left is attached to two similar atoms or two hydrogens and that means this will not have a cis and trans. So this is the structure of X. Propenoic acid can be produced industrially from propane 1, 2, 3 trial, a byproduct of the manufacture of biodiesel. The first step is a dehydration reaction to convert the gaseous propane 1, 2, 3 triol, so that is the reactant we're starting with on the left, and we're changing it to propenal, and this reaction requires a catalyst. Then the question says, explain how a catalyst increases the rate of a reaction. Use the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution shown, refer to the collision theory, of course, we said a catalyst will increase the rate of a reaction. Now, how does it increase the rate of a reaction? We said the energy of activation will be lowered. Now, how does it lower the energy of activation? And the catalyst provides an alternative pathway with lower activation energy. So more particles have energy higher than activation energy, and that means more of the collisions would be successful. The propenal is then oxidized to propenoic acid. So we have propenal, that's the one we got from that first reaction, and we're trying to oxidize it to propenoic acid. Remember the propenal has an aldehyde group at the top there, so we want to oxidize it to propenoic. Write an equation for this reaction using this oxygen Signal symbol to represent the oxygen from the oxidizing agent. So, of course, we're starting with the propenal. Now we're going to oxidize it, and that means it changes the aldehyde part into an acid, COOH. One synthetic route for the production of propenoic acid uses propene. So, the other one was starting from uh, the trial, this one is starting from propene that is obtained from crude oil. Remember, he said the other one was obtained from uh, biomass. So, propene derived from crude oil, we start and we produce in the end the propenoic acid. 
suggests suitable reagents and conditions for the conversion of propene to propane 1, 2 diol. That means I'm starting with an alkene and I want to put an OH on both carbons. Remember that that means I need to add cold, aqueous, put acidify, potassium permanganate that changes from purple to colorless. So the reagents are cold, aqueous, potassium permanganate with uh, sulfuric acid so that it is acidified. And the last question says, suggest why the production of propenoic acid from propane 1, 2, 3 triol is more sustainable than its production from propene. Remember, we had two routes by which they produced propenoic acid. The first one started from the propane 1, 2, 3 triol, which they mentioned could be obtained from biomass, and then oxidizing it to get the acid. The other route was starting from propene and we ended up with the propenoic acid. Now, why is the first method better? Of course, the propene is obtained from crude oil, which is non-renewable, while the propane 1, 2, 3 triol may be obtained from biomass, so that's one advantage. And the fact that the propane 1, 2, 3 triol produces only water as a byproduct, while the propene, remember to change it to diol, we had to oxidize it with potassium permanganate. So these uh, byproducts of manganese compounds will need to be separated in order to continue. So this could be more uh, expensive or uh, less profitable. And that's the end of this. Uh, I hope this was useful to you. And thank you for listening.